And Atika, we are grateful to have you here and we will turn the time over to you. Oh, that's me right now. Okay, cool. So hi, everybody. I just hate to tell you, I got 20 entries into the raffle. So good luck tonight with your one entries. Just kidding. So my name is Tika Dergan, and I am the emergency manager for the city of Tacoma. I have been in my position a total of two months and three days as of today. So still super new to that. So I'll tell you a little bit about my emergency management career. My degree is in Homeland Security Emergency Management that I got from Pierce College in Lakewood. And I did an internship all four years at uh, Thurston County Emergency Management, where I was largely involved in public outreach and doing their disaster assistance response team, which I built from the ground up. So I'm really excited that I got to be a part of that. And then I went to emergency management division where I volunteered with Ro Roseanne Guerin, who was their preparedness person at the time. And then she retired and I got Hi, Jennifer. Yes, I know Jennifer. So I was like, this is this got to be the same Jennifer. How many Jennifer shawls in the world are there? So I know Jennifer because I worked at EMD. I worked in um, hazardous materials before I graduated. I worked with them as an admin, but they let me help draft plans. And so planning and preparedness is my heart. And so we're going to you'll find that out today because I could talk about emergency preparedness and planning like it's nobody's business. Then I did a short stint as a disaster um, coordinator for Red Cross. And by short stint, I mean two months, because then I got hired on at Department of Health. And I was there for two years. And all I have done with my time there is COVID. So then I got hired on at City of Tacoma. And it was great being back in emergency management. And so now I'm here with you. So I have tons of different types of knowledge. But I'm really excited to talk about emergency preparedness. Um, you know, I'm really informal. I will probably say a lot of weird jokes or do something awkward. So if you see it, just go with it and or laugh if that's okay too. If you have any questions or if I go too fast, which can happen, please let me know. Uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself at the end of each slide. I'll kind of ask if there's any questions when it, I mean, I'm not going to ask at the end of the beginning slide, of course. So we'll ask, uh, I'll ask that if you see me looking really weird at the computer, it's because I'm trying to figure out why it's not working. Um, I did recorded a presentation the other day and I couldn't figure out how to share on teams. And so the first two minutes of the video were just me trying to like stare at it. So, you know, I'm just letting you know, me and my surface don't get along well. So, right. we, will get so we are going to talk about emergency preparedness and we're going to talk about being prepared as the individual and being prepared as a community. So I have learned a little bit about safe streets and so I'm very excited to be a part of this. I don't know if any of you live in the Lakewood area, but someone close to me, her name was Michelle Galaz. She was a part of safe streets for a very long time. And so now she lives in California. But when I told her I was doing this presentation, she was very excited. And I did get to have a meeting with Roxanne yesterday. And she is very passionate about the work that you all do and very passionate about learning how to be prepared for not only herself, but her community. And she's doing a really good job of being prepared for herself so she can help take care of others. So one thing that is talked about heavily is the prepare in a year. So it gives you 12 months of cool things to do. I don't necessarily think they need to be done in any particular order. I think if you decide whatever you want to do, maybe your first month you want to learn about grab and go kits, then I think that that's totally up for you. You can make your one month one, month one a grab and go kit. So at city emergency management, they haven't done a lot of emergency preparedness. And so my whole goal over the next year, 2022, is to talk about emergency preparedness, start preparing our employees around the city, and most importantly, teaching the public how to prepare for disasters for themselves and their family. I like Game of Thrones, so I keep preaching that preparedness is coming. Not a lot of people get it, but when they do get it, they start laughing because it's like, yeah, it's like creepy, but cool. So preparedness is coming and it's going to come whether you, you know, do it in order as this dictates or you do it whatever order fits you. So making sure that you have uh, every month you do something to make sure you're prepared is key. So first we'll start with communications plan. So this is how you're going to get information and give any information. The best thing you can do is get an out of area contact 
preferably somebody out of state. That way you have the ability to actually call. So we know that once a disaster strikes, the ability to call within state is going to be minimal, if not there at all. So your ability to call out of state would be a lot easier if you um, have that contact. So it would be one and a backup. I always say have a backup contact that you can have your family check in. So your aunt Betty wants to know how you're doing. Then you would have them call your cousin Curtis, which I have an uncle named Curtis, which is why I said Curtis, but you would have your cousin call your cousin Curtis. And then they can provide the update to Aunt Betty about how you're doing. And um, then you got the information and everybody's getting the same consistent information from one person on how you're doing instead of trying to call you. So there's different sources that you can use, which are here and they are listed. And I can also, the they do have a Connor and um, Roxanne do have copies of the slides. So if you would like to look at any of these resources, the America Red Cross has one. Facebook has a cool safety check, like people mark themselves safe all the time. But we do know Facebook goes down. All of us panicked a few days ago or last week, whenever it was, when it was down and we didn't know what to do with ourselves. We had to act normal. So we couldn't check in that we were Facebook safe from the Facebook downage. So be mindful of that. Make sure you have a communications plan that's clearly communicated to your closest family and your out of area contact needs to make sure that that is their role. Because if they start getting random calls, it's not going to be cool. They would be very confused. So within the city of Tacoma, we do have a Tacoma prepared app, which you can get on either the Apple Store or Google Play. I have it. We're actually revamping it. It's going to have, it's got a lot of just random things on there now. So we're going to clean it up and make it look a lot better and do what it's supposed to do. You can also sign up if you're in Pierce County, or I know some of you are in unincorporated areas. So if that's the case, I would just suggest that you try to sign up for whatever alert area is closest to yours. You may be closer to Pierce County or Kitsap, whichever one you can get your hands on, or you could do both. That way you know what's going on in the area. I would also say um, the FEMA app, which I talked about with Connor and Roxanne earlier when I got on, is a really good tool. You can get that on the Apple Store or the Play Store. It's just, you just FEMA app search, and you can actually pull that up and do it by city and by county to get those alerts for what's going on in your area. Sometimes you get them before they bring it up on the news as far as weather, but I love that app. I use it to check on my family when they're in other places, and I use it to keep track of both Thurston County where I live and Pierce County where I work. So you can create an action plan and your action plan. This is really vital for um, not just yourself and your family, but actually for your community. So if you have a community of five people and you know you're the only person, you guys are the only ones that are going to have the ability to help each other until help gets there, you're going to want to know where you're going to meet. You're going to want to know it, who in your neighborhood, if they can return to their home, where is going to be a safe place for them. Do you need to shelter in place? What does that look like for you? And how can you help others if they aren't able to um, physically support sheltering themselves in place, which is really hard to, it's a lot to consider, especially if you live near um, some assisted living facilities and maybe you guys do some check-ins with them, which a lot of people do, but that's totally up to you. These are things that you can do for yourself, but it's really important as a community to understand your hazards and to also understand some of these plans. Where can you meet? Where can you go? What's going to be the, who's going to be the person that you call? Are you sheltering in place? What room are you going to shelter in place? And what does that look like? Considerations for your pets. And I, again, I already mentioned people who have um, individual assistance needs. So that might be somebody who's wheel wheelchair bound or may not have any sort of transportation. So you would know what that looks like one in your home with your family, but more importantly, you would know what that looks like within your community. And you wanna practice and maintain your plan, especially if you're doing it for your community. With your family, it's a lot easier to kind of just make the plan and then look at it every now and then. But when you're working with your community and you're looking to support them, that is going to be something that helps you identify those areas of improvement where those gaps are and how you and your organization or you as an individual can step in and fill in the need, um, fill in those gaps for your community. So this talks about Mount Rainier Lahars, which 
we all know about. Um, Mount Rainier is a giant glacier. So once it goes, it's going to be a lot of boiling water is what I like to say. So it's not going to be good for your tea because you'd burn your fingers off. So don't do that. But you just want to be mindful of the areas if you do live in any, of, in any of these areas. And it looks like Tacoma, they're actually getting ready to, the USGS is actually getting ready to do a new um, update to the Lahars and what that's going to look like. So this will change as that research comes out. And it looks like they're going to have it come out in um, January. So we're looking at the new year. So this will change. So as information gets put out and you want to just keep up with that, so start looking um, around the beginning of the year and see if maybe some of these maps or areas that could be affected by Lahar have changed because things change all the time. So we know about inundations from fault zones. Uh, the Seattle fault is one of them that would have a large effect on the port of Seattle and it would have an effect on the Seattle or the Tacoma port, which is you know, my baby, which I'm learning a lot about, and it stresses me out, but that's okay. That's my job. This is what I do. But so you just want to know um, some of those effects. I know that some of you live across the narrows. And so you're going to want to know how that could affect things for you. I don't think it would be um, completely devastating, but anytime there's a rise in water, you want to know what a damage that could do. And it's easy to, um, if you go to, uh, gosh, I want to say, um, you know what, let me think about the website, but there's a website where you can go and kind of watch how this would, how these inundation zones or tsunamis would move once the fault lines have, once you've had an earthquake. Okay, so water storage, you can store it in your, store it in your home, preferably enough water for two weeks, one gallon of water per person per day. That's a lot of water. So be very mindful that if you are trying to stay in your home for two weeks without help, and I would always suggest that you have more than two weeks because you don't know how long it's going to take for help to get there. And if you have enough to help someone else, then even for a day or two, then that's going to be vital in saving someone's life in that moment. So make sure you have a lot of water stored in a good place. Make sure it's in a sealed container. So a lot of people, what they do is they take milk jugs or they take water jugs and they just keep pouring them out and refilling them. And then they store that water. You can buy emergency water. Um, we'll talk about it in your go kit. One thing I do um, recommend is on Amazon, they have the emergency water patches, a bunch of them in the, in the boxes that you can put in your go kit, but we'll get to that later. So Oh, we do have the go bag here. So yeah, you want to have your water with you as much as you can. I like the water um, pouches that have a ton in my car and a ton in my work car. So my work car has a giant car kit and my car has a car kit. So I'm always prepared as much as I can be. If you have pets, be mindful of that. Um, I want to tell a funny story really quick. I had a beta. She did pass away because I think I moved her tank. I switched her into a bigger tank and she just was not a fan. But I had a beta and we were talking about if a disaster were to happen. And I said, well, I watched Finding Nemo. So you just flush the beta down the toilet so she has a better chance at living. And then probably a few weeks ago, I was listening to a radio show or a podcast. And the lady was like, don't flush your fish. Finding Nemo is not real. They don't go straight to the ocean and live better lives. And I was like, oh gosh, no, because I was totally going to flush Belle down the toilet because she would survive better than if I was trying to carry her around in her fishbowl. So funny story. I did not know that fish don't live better lives once you flush them. Not all roads lead to the ocean right away. So make sure you're ready to take care of your pets. You can add a water filter to your kit so you can uh, life straws. My, my husband has one for when he goes camping. So if you and hiking, cause he likes to do that mountainous stuff. So life straws are huge. If you want to get one of those and you can also find other filters. And I think there's tablets you can now put in your water to kind of help filter it out. So there's tons of things. you probably find them all on Amazon. All right. So we can talk about building your grab and go kits. Everybody knows food, water, batteries, all of that fun stuff. But the things I want to talk about that I think are always the most important and the most overlooked are things like your medication and any of your personal um, information. So maybe a wedding certificate, copies of your driver's license or your birth certificate or your social security. 
you want to have one of those in your home kit and you want to have one in your grab and go kit. And for medication, one thing that my grandma, I love her and she's gone to, to better places, but one thing that I would always tell her because she lived in the Valley in Auburn and it stressed me out is I said, you know, your medication, you always call for your refill. And once you get your refill, you still have a few extra, take those few extra every time and just keep adding it to the bottle, the correct bottle. And she did, she had a supply of extra medicine in case she ever needed it because people don't think about those things and making sure that they're in their kits. Another one would be an extra pair of glasses. So when I get my exam on the ninth or whatever day of the week that is, I'm going to take these and I'm going to put them in my go kit so that if I lose my other pair, I have a pair because I can't read without them. I just squint and it looks, I look like Mr. Magoo with longer hair. So you just want to make sure that you're paying attention to those as far as your personal items. So that would be um, anything that identifies your pets, your children, who you are. You could do your mortgage or your the deed to your house. So you're going to want to scan those things. Some people put them in lock boxes or they put them in places like um, like you can get one of those little safe boxes or whatever at the bank or whatnot. I'm a huge fan of scanning them and then putting them on a USB drive, one that you can keep in your go bag and they have the waterproof deal. So if your bag gets wet, that won't get wet but I would put one in your go bag and I would also put one or two in your larger emergency kit. Cause you never know when you're going to need those and you never know what's going to happen in a, at a moment's notice. And you may not have time to try to grab all those documents up. And so if you already have it somewhere that's safe and you know, you've got copies of it for when you need it, that's going to be huge. So those are the things that I'm always like, let's pay attention to. Let's make sure we have it. It's very easy to think about all of the other things on this list. But one thing I want to emphasize is your medication, your documents, and anything that you may need that would take care of your needs. So an extra pair of glasses, you might need an extra knee brace or, or an extra wrist brace so that, you know, you're taking care of yourself when you don't have all of the supplies in front of you to do it. You could talk about your car kit. Um, you could have a small shovel. I don't have one. Everything else I have in my car. Um, so my car kit consists of a lot of blankets, food, water, and, and all this, you know, other car stuff that people need. Um, but I think that when you are in your car, what is the thing that you're going to want the most? And I'm always cold. So blankets is one. I do have a book in there. Then everything else came secondary. So I, Full disclosure, when I was running, when I was working for Department of Health, I was running the mass vac site in Wenatchee, and I decided to come home, even though I'd been stuck on the other side of the pass for over a month, and I got stuck on the pass, and I was stuck on the pass for two hours, and I was very stressed out because I was, in my mind, I was going to run all the way out of gas, and so I start digging around, grabbing blankets because I was going to freeze to death, even though the car was running. I'm a little bit of a hypochondriac. So I start grabbing my blankets, didn't even think about the food or anything else. I just grabbed my blankets and I sat there. And then I remembered, oh, well, I have a book too, to kind of keep me company. But uh, after I freaked out over my blankets and grabbed my book, the pass was open and people started moving. So that's how long I was stressed out about all the things I didn't need to be stressed out about because I was prepared. So just be mindful that if you do get stuck in your car for whatever reason, you're going to want some form of entertainment for yourself. So those things are also essential to think about, even in your grab and go kit and even in your at home emergency kit. Maybe you like to play cards. Maybe you like crossword puzzles. Those are the kind of things to make sure you put in there, too, because then you'd just be really bored with a lot of emergency supplies. And that's going to be fun for no one. Sega, before we continue. Uh, yeah. There is a bit of discussion right now going on in the chat regarding personal documents. There's uh, concern about having it in a, uh, a place uh, where people could maybe steal it if it's easily accessible, uh, if you're trying to, you know, so you can actually get up and go, but that means someone else could come in and take it. And also a question of having them in relation to car kits. Yeah, I do not have one in my car kit. I cannot say that I do. That's not something I thought about. Um, the best thing that you can do. And so let me just say, I'm no, I 
am not a huge fan of having physical copies of things, right? I think you should have them and they should be in a place that's safe and locked up so you can get to them. Um, for example, my vaccine card is safe and put away and nobody can get to it, but I do have a copy of it for on the off chance that I need it. Um, I'm more so referring to putting them on a USB drive and with the USB drive, you can lock that. So even if it got stolen, it would be a little bit hard to hack. So there's all, there's different, I mean, you kind of got to like figure out, you know, really where your battles are. Yeah, it is easy to steal things, which I see is it's not safe. It's not, do not put a copy of your social security card in your car. I don't have a copy of any of that stuff in my car. Those copies are on USB drives in my grow bag and in my emergency kit at home. Um, the physical copies are locked up in our, we have a little like Brinks file thing. So that's locked up in there. Um, yes, so yeah, just be mindful. Oh, see, yeah, Jennifer just put, uh, there's a genius scan app for keeping your docs. So you can do that too. You have Google Drive on your phones. And, um, oh, that's not bad. It's $9. So I had not heard of that. So your phones are the most accessible things to you 90% of the time. So there's all kinds of things. There's all sorts of things. We have copies of uh, some of our documents on our Google Drive and that's locked so we can only see it. So just be mindful of how you do that. I'm just, I want to reiterate, I'm not a fan of keeping copies of anything as far as paper goes. I am a fan of figuring out how to store it electronically so that it's safe because that's going to be the quickest way for you to have those documents readily accessible if you aren't able to stop and grab them or if you're out and a disaster happens and you happen to have it on your phone or you happen to have like your go bag with you, which should always be with you. I have a go bag that I take from my car into the office and it goes from the office into my car back into the house and it's always with me. So it's not something that is going to stay in your car, um, but you have it in case you need it in that moment. So that's what I will say. Um, if there if, is there any other questions around documents? April has her hand raised. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you for clarifying that because when you were going over that last slide, it sounded like you were saying to put copies of your, like your social security card and stuff in your car. And I was like, whoa, oh, no, no, no. as much as cars get broken into. So yeah, the way that you had explained it at first, that's what it sounded like. So I appreciate you clarifying that. Oh yeah, no, I apologize. I'm definitely, I don't even like leaving my coat in my car because I'm always afraid somebody's going to try to steal my coat. Probably not, but in my mind, someone's going to steal my coat. So no, definitely not. So I apologize about the confusion there. Um, any other questions? The slide that we're on right now, it's a list of important documents that you can store. Um, so if these are some things that you have, these are going to want to be things that you make copies of valuables. So I do want to talk about photos really quick. My grandmother passed away and she has, so I'm over all of her stuff. And she has these old, old family pictures from our home in Alabama. And it's, they're old, old, like all black and white that they were blown up to be in larger frames. And my family just went bonkers over trying to figure out who was going to get them, how they were going to get them. We scanned them took them to a place, had them printed, and we were able to give my family some without them being crazy. And so none of them know if they got the original because they didn't. We, <laughs> I have them. But um, one thing that to be mindful of is that you will always have those. If you can scan them and save them, you can put them on a thumb drive, you can do whatever. So if you go through your house and you see some photos that you may want to you know, keep or have to pass down to your kids or just even to look at however you want to, whatever you want to think about them, I would, that's what I would suggest doing, because even if we lost the originals, we now have the scanned copies of them um, that we can pull off of um, my doc, my docs on my phone and also my laptop. So they're on both locations. They aren't stored on a thumb drive yet, which I should do, but they are saved to my Google drive and locked. So any other questions on this before we move forward? Okay. 
Maybe we'll move forward. I don't know. There we go. Okay, so we talk about being two weeks ready. The reason we no longer say three way, three days, three ways is because in reality, and I'm just going to be candid with you because I believe in telling the truth, two weeks ready is nice. But in reality, you need to be at least one month ready because if we did have a full subduction zone eruption of Cascadia, and all of us have heard about that, the earthquake that happened years and years and years ago that now we have like a 20 or 13% chance or something weird like that of it happening in our lifetime. So if that were to happen, it would take a very long time for resources to get to us. And you have to consider, do you live on the other side of the narrows? How many overpasses are between you and help? Right. So if you I'm not an overpass person, I will literally leave such a gap because my biggest <laughs> I have these fears after becoming an emergency manager that I'm going to be stuck under an overpass and the quake's going to happen. And then that's that's it for me. So I'd rather somebody else take that chance and me just give them the space to do that if that's what they want to do. So but when I think about it, I live in Lacey. I work in Tacoma and resources would take a long time to get to me. And it would take a long time to get to them because those overpasses may not hold. And I know they're doing a lot of reconstruction to make them up to code, but right now, none of those are really gonna hold and we don't know how they would do in a large scale earthquake. So moral of the story is be ready for as long as possible for you to be ready. So you wanna consider your lighting, your shelter, your food, sanitation. I just learned a couple of years ago when I did um, ICS 300 and 400, Justin Fordyce was talking about, um, adult litter bags. And I didn't know that that was a real thing. And I laughed because I was like, that's crazy. They don't have those. No, they're real. So I did not know that that was real. They're used in the military. Um, and my husband knew because he's a military man. And I said, oh, I didn't know that those were real things. So that's how that works. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can look at. You can buy those already pre-made. I think it's like the five gallon tubs or whatever. It's like huge where they have not just food, but other things in it. So kind of just think about what you would need to take care of, not just yourself, but if you have pets, because obviously flushing your fish down the toilet is not a good way to go. So those are things that you want to be mindful of. Do you have enough bedding and clothing to take care of yourself? If you can't use your washer and dryer, how would you do that? So there's a lot of different things that you can um, consider when you do preparedness. It can be overwhelming. But I will tell you one thing that I do every month without fail is I switch out my peanut butter and I look at our canned food. That is about as good as it gets, or I'll see something and I'm like, we should buy this for safety reasons. Um, all of our cabinets and um, like I have this giant, you, I don't know if you can see my, you can probably see my screen, but I have this giant curio cabinet next to me. And that is the one thing in my house that is not Velcroed or, or, um, secured against the wall. And it is the biggest headache because I know that it's not, and, and I know that it should be, but my cabinets are reinforced, things like that. So there's a lot you can do to kind of make sure you're ready or things to think about around your home, which we'll get to because I obviously just jumped the gun, but just kind of consider what you have at your home. We do buy new first aid kits. Um, kind of depends on how much we use ours at home. So once it gets down to a certain spot, then we just buy new ones. Or we start buying supplies to kind of just add to the first aid kit. So we have first aid kits everywhere. I think we'd be okay for band-aids for about two months. Um, but we have all kinds of other stuff. We even have a little kit that we bought if I needed to give somebody stitches. So I think I'm prepared to amputate and stitch somebody up. Reggie won't let me do that. He won't let me try it on him. But things you can do to be two weeks ready. Um, and there's more on that. Learn fire safety. If your house does not have a smoke detector, detector or a carbon monoxide detector, one, if it doesn't have a smoke detector, when you figure that out, why does that happen? And a carbon monoxide detector, I know you can buy those. They're not too expensive. So you can buy one and pretty much install it in your home or put it on the wall. Ours are just ones that, are, um, that were bought and put on the wall and they seem to work great. Uh, make sure you have extra batteries for your smoke detector. That's always a big deal. Make sure you have a fire extinguisher and you know where it's at. I Last summer, I set the grill on fire and we could not find the fire extinguisher. 
we found it after we looked in the crawl space and it was tucked all the way back in the crawl space in our house. And that was luckily my husband knew what to do and got rid of the fire because the whole grill was on fire. And I was ready to call 911 and freak out because I couldn't find the fire extinguisher. So in my mind, the house was on fire. But um, be mindful of that. Make sure it's in a place where you can easily access it, not in the back of your crawl space. But you want to make sure you have it, you know how to use it. If you don't know how to use it and you need some help, I'm pretty sure your local fire station would not mind showing you that. But there's all kinds of descriptions and YouTube videos. Properly store flammable items. You should probably, you don't want to store them next to anything hot. I do have, um, I just had to move. We did have house guests and they had put the lighter fluid for the grill under the kitchen sink with all of the other chemicals. And I just was not a fan of that when I saw it. So I had to move stuff out of the way. And I moved that, uh, I took the flammable thing and moved it to the part of a garage where it should be, where it's safe from anything that could catch it on fire or where it could interact with any other chemicals if it were to tip over and create some kind of mess. Um, you could practice fire safety in your household. Fire drills are great if you have grandchildren or little ones at your home. My niece and nephew come over all the time. We don't have any kiddos, but when my niece and nephew come over, I have them practice all kinds of things. We, I did take them to the ocean and I said, if the ground starts moving, we're out. I don't care about anything else. We're not going to wait. We get in the car. I don't care if your floaties hanging out there, you get in the car and you go. So I'm always teaching them something when they're over. And when we go places, so drills are great. If you have um, people in your home that also um, may need a little extra help. So practicing that with them is not a bad idea. You can learn utility safety, your natural gas, how to turn it off, how to turn it on. And the one thing that I was told, and Jennifer, please feel free to let me know if I'm saying this incorrectly. When it comes to relighting the pilot or your gas you don't turn that on on your own. I believe that I just want to, I don't know if I'm correct in that, but um, if you have, I believe one, if you don't turn it on your own. You actually wait until utilities can come out and take care of that for you. But make sure you, if you smell anything that doesn't smell right, go turn it off. Check your electrical cord. Oh, let's see here. There's the chat just popped up. Thanks, Jennifer. So yeah, do not ever try that on your own. Not a good idea. Um, make sure you know your electrical box stuff. We actually had to go through and relabel ours because ours were all worn off and I didn't know where anything was. We were just trying to flip switches at one point when we were fixing our disposal to see if it would work uh, to turn off certain controls. And that was not a good idea. So the emergency manager and me wouldn't allow that. So we went ahead and relabeled things. So we know exactly where it's at. There's nothing in the way of it. Cause of course it's in our garage. And, um, I had my husband build his gym on the other side, just so that I was sure it wasn't um, messing up or covering our electrical box. Okay. Every time I don't click on the screen. So you can store your under the bed supplies. Uh, these are items that you can have as your under the bed supplies. I do not put them under my bed um, for fear of me accidentally kicking them too far under the bed or if something were to happen um, and I weren't able to get under the bed. So everything is right in front of my little side table. So I could just have to put my feet over the bed, grab and go. Um, but there's nothing next to my bed that if it fell over would prevent me from getting to it. So if you want to store it under your bed, you absolutely can't. It will help you if you have to get up and things are falling and they've shattered. You're not going to hurt your feet on them. So you want to be mindful of that. If you have no power, I don't like the dark. So flashlights are huge or candles. If you don't have um, the flashlight, you can have your candle with the little automatic flame deal or a lighter next to you. So you can light your way until uh, you can find a flashlight. So there's different options for people. Um, make sure you have extra clothes next to your bed. So some people like to sleep in their God-given glory, right? And then some people like to sleep in an abundance of clothes, but whatever your preference, make sure there's an extra pair of clothes or something you can throw on really quick next to your bed. So right next on top of my shoes and my socks, is like a sweater because I'm always cold. So 
make sure you have something there. That's always my thing. So you can put it under your bed, you can put it next to your bed, but if it's next to your bed, make sure it's going to be accessible, that there's nothing that could fall over on it and keep you and prevent you from getting to those items. Okay, so you practice drop, cover, and hold on. I'm going to use this plug. On Thursday, we have the Washington, you know, great shakeout at 10, 21 a.m. So practice drop, cover, and hold on. I'm going to say this because every time I've said it so far, I don't think it'll be with this crowd, but someone's always said to me, you don't just run out the door. And I'm like, no, that's how you die is when you're running out because things start falling over and you can't always outrun what's falling over. You have no idea what's going to happen once you're trying to get out those doors. So drop cover and hold on. Always protect your head. Um, this shows if people are in wheelchairs. Um, if you're in your bed, you flip over, you put your pillow over your head and you protect your head, put your hands above your head, just like in all of these other pictures. Um, if you're at home and you don't have anywhere to drop cover and hold on, then you want to find the best wall that you can put yourself against, slide down, cover your head and in your hands, much like these other pictures. If you are by the coast, of course, head to higher ground. Don't even wait. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't chance it. Just get as quick as you can because not everybody is going to run and you do want to be that person that takes off so that you're, you're getting to safety quick. Um, so those are things to be mindful of. Any questions about the drop cover and hold on? Great. All right, so preparing to shelter in place. So you're gonna wanna find a safe room. If you have a safe room, not everybody's gonna have a room that's gonna be safe. So that might be your living room. Maybe you have to figure out how to prepare your living room to shelter in place. This would be in case of a chemical, radiological, or biological threat. So these are different items that you can get, plastic sheeting or trash bags, duct tapes, radios. You're going to want to have all of those things. If you have a furnace or a fan or anything that is going to pull in or circulate any type of air, turn it off. Don't open your windows. Don't do anything like that because all it's going to do is bring the chemical inside and your most important role in that moment is to protect yourself. I'd rather you sweat a thousand bullets than get than open a window or turn on a fan and end up losing your life or becoming sick from whatever's in the air at that point. These are things that you can do. Like I said, find a pre-selected room, preferably one that doesn't have windows would be best. But if it has windows, just make sure you're sealing those windows tight and that whatever you're going to use to take care of that room is in that room. You don't want it to be three rooms over and then you're trying to run back and forth to make sure that the room is prepared for you to shelter in place. You're going to want to prepare that as soon as possible. So make sure that room has the storage of everything that you're going to need to use to shelter in place there, including an emergency kit, right? Because you don't know how long you're going to be there. So you're going to want to make sure that not only does your house have one, but your shelter in place room has one if you can, if you can um, store it in there. So be mindful of that. And then you wait. So that's what your radio is for. You wait for further instruction from the radio and or Facebook or whatever outlet you're going to use to check on um, to check on when it's okay to go outside or whatever further instructions are going to be. Okay, so this is where we're talking about my wonderful curio cabinet that is not Velcroed. You want to do a home hazard hunt. So what does that look like? Are you subject to having things fall over all the time is your TV secure, right? In the days of flat screens, a lot of people hang them on the wall. But is that, is it really secured to the wall enough that if it were to shake, it wouldn't fall off the wall? Make sure your water heater is fastened in. So you just go into our water heater is fastened in. People who live in apartments don't have to worry about that so much. So just be mindful of what your hazards are. Is your bookshelf good to go? We had a bookshelf that was leaning forward at one point. We got rid of it because I said, this is just going to fall. And we had too many books on it. So we bought more, a better bookshelf and two of them so that we didn't uh, topple it over. But we want to make sure that all of those things that could fall over, that could cause damage to you or make it impossible for you to get out are secure. Um, 
you can't control everything, right? Like I said, our cabinets are reinforced. So if there were shaking, we would hopefully save most of our dishes, but I know some of them you can't save, right? So be mindful of that. This says use your earthquake eyes. And I think that that's, that's actually funny. I think that's really sweet. So look at your, use your earthquake eyes. What could fall over on you? Where you, um, are these items secure? And there may be something that you say, this could prevent myself or someone else from getting out. And so be mindful of that. Practice your drop cover and hold on. All these fun things. Any questions regarding your home hazard hunt? which I think is pretty straight to the point, but I wanna be sure I answer any questions about that. Great. All right, so we will get into what is called next steps. So you guys are safe streets. I'm not going to preach about CERT, which is the Community Emergency Response Team, but and joining it. But what I will say is that there's benefit to becoming CERT certified. And the benefit of that is we get to use you. Um, the emergency proclamations do cover you when we need volunteers and you get a lot of training. So does that mean that you can't do safe streets if you get cert certified? No. And each of your, most of, most cities do have cert. If they don't, please let me know. And um, we can find you a program that would probably be closest to you. There are some places like Thurston County, they did not have a cert team. They had disaster assistance response team but they all went through the CERT training. So you can go through the CERT training and get CERT certified and have a certain level of involvement in the CERT program if you'd like. If you do not have a CERT program, then I would reach out to the nearest CERT program and just see if you can get CERT certified. You all are in safe streets. I don't think anybody would tell you no, um, but that's, that's going to be huge. It's fun training. It's a lot of people that you get to meet and interact with once you can do face-to-face -face trainings again. So those are going to be some things that you consider as really what groups can you get involved in or kind of partner with, because you can partner with CERT being a part of Safe Streets and just see and get involved in some trainings and things that will, and that will teach you different things. And one, get you out in the community and learning more about the people you're around. So that's my plug for CERT. Like I said, um, Thurston County did not have a CERT team until Lacey Fire, I think two years ago, started to do community CERT trainings. So they did have a disaster assistance response team, which and they still have it, which is my baby. And they, um, but they are all CERT certified, but they are not CERT members. So next is map your neighborhood. So that I've been told is now going through a revamp. I was told that a few months or a couple months ago, actually, when I started back in emergency management, because the other one is kind of older. However, I like map your neighborhood because it actually gets you with your community. You know your community best and you are the only people who are going to be able to respond first right? You are the first responder. There is not always going to be fire EMS or police that can get to you right away. So you are that first responder. So understanding that maybe the lady next door has diabetes and you might want to check on her or the gentleman next door only has, um, you know, maybe he's an amputee or someone down the street can't, you know, you just want to know what's going on in your community. And that's huge to my heart because I understand that that's all you have. And so, Map Your Neighborhood allows you to get your community group together. It allows you to understand where your resources are and where your strengths are in your community and those around you that would need help. And maybe those around you that you would just want to, they may not need help, but you want to check in on. So maybe every night, maybe Miss Susie turns on her light to let everybody know she's home and okay. So her, you know, if her porch light is on, everything is good to go with her. If her porch light is not on, you know to check on Miss Susie if it's not on by seven o'clock. And it allows you to kind of work with your community to determine if they do need help. So normally in Map Your Neighborhood, they do have signs that say okay or not okay or need help or whatever. So those signs are vital to you being able to understand. But if somebody can't put that sign in their window, you're going to want to know to check on them. And so it may not be the Map Your Neighborhood signs that you use. It's a great concept and I love it. And there's a whole video, so it walks you through it, right? So it walks you through the whole thing. You don't have to be well-versed in it. You pop the video in and just follow the instructions and you pause every now and then so you can talk amongst yourselves and kind of figure things out. 
It's a great way to get people talking. It's a great way to learn um, one preparedness, but also everybody around you. And like I said, the strengths of your community and those that you may want to lean upon. So Phil next door might have the ability to store extra food. And you guys may say, hey, let's give Phil extra food every other month so that we're prepared to take care of our community. Or someone next door may have a medical skill or license, and then you may know that that's the person you want to lean on. So understanding your resources, understanding what your community can do for each other until help does arrive is important. It is the thing that people overlook the most. So knowing who's around you, knowing how you can support each other is huge. I could preach preparedness all day, but I think community preparedness is my favorite because you're all you have. And I've seen too many times when there's been a fire or there's been an incident and the first people always on the scene are what, either the neighbors or somebody already in the house or someone across the street or someone down the way who knows what's going on with them. There's always someone there that can tell you, well, this person has this, this and this or whatever. So they're always the first on the scene, even if they're just there to record. So understanding how you can help your neighbors is gonna be huge. And more importantly, understanding what it can do to build the resiliency of your community until help comes is even more vital because in that moment, you're saving lives. And that's my preach on that. So here's a list of resources that you can use. Um, Tsunami is, is the DNR site. I did think it was the DNR site. So you can go to the DNR site and it does, you can kind of there's, I don't know exactly where it is on DNR, but play around on the site. And you can actually look to see what it would look like if we had a Cascadia eruption and how that tsunami would move inland and um, what to expect. So it's kind of interesting. It's, you know, to me, I'm a worry wart and a hypochondriac, so it stresses me out, but I also love my job. So here I am. And that is going to be it. So I'm going to get out of here and stop sharing my screen. Thank you for putting up with me. Are there any questions or comments, concerns? Angela, except that's not Angela, I don't think. <laughs> Go ahead, you're live. Yeah, uh, you mentioned about um, chemical mm -hmm. uh, situations. Now, would that be uh, a good time to buy a, a protective mask of some kind? Yeah, so you can do that. I mean, what you would want to do, though, if you're going to buy a protective mask, though, is really do some good, hard, long research about what that mask is going to protect you from, because it's kind of like the difference between a cloth mask and an N95, right? So the N95 is protecting you much more than that cloth mask is. So you're really going to want to research what that mask is going to protect you from if you were in a situation where you needed to put it on because you weren't able to really protect yourself and shelter in place, or even if where you were at to shelter in place wasn't adequately sealed off, right, and protected. So if you're going to want to do that, just I would do some research into that. And yes, th that would be those kind of attacks I would think that you would want, uh, you would want a mask for mm -hmm. if you could get one. And they are probably um, a little expensive, but it's one of those things, like I said, if you are, if that's what you want to invest in, take the time and invest in it, but do some really good research or else you'll get, you'll kind of get screwed over by people that are selling these knockoff masks. So. Another question. Yes, sir. Okay. Now in this area, what should we prepare for, be prepared for the most? Would it be the earthquakes, tsunamis, or would it be, i.e., mountain terrorist attacks, for example? Yeah. Are you in, you're in Tacoma area? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, this is honestly what I think. You're going to want to prepare first for an earthquake. And if you live close enough, I mean, I'm always watching what's going on on the military bases and watching things that fly overhead because you never know, right? It's a no-fly zone where we are anyway. But I'm always concerned about terrorist attacks too. But earthquakes are your number one. I would say that your volcanoes, yeah, I mean, that's a big deal. But where we are in, in the city of Tacoma, we're 
pretty elevated. And so unless you live close to the Ruston Way waterfront or close to Nisqually, just be mindful that smoke is going to smoke and ash are probably going to be your biggest issues here within the city or within Pierce County in general. So just be mindful of that. I would say earthquakes, number one, absolutely all day. Um, and then I would say probably, like I said, terrorist attacks, I'm always thinking about that, but you just want, you never know. So that's kind of up to you, but earthquakes, I would say even, um, I would also say fires because those keep happening more and more around us than just over in Eastern Washington, right? So we see more and more fires up and down I-5 all the time. And we see more and more fires within the community. When I started with city of Tacoma in August, tons of brush fire calls in neighborhoods. And there was a homeless encampment that caught on fire and it was actually shooting fireworks at someone's house because apparently they had a whole tent full of fireworks and it was shooting fireworks at someone's house. So yeah, there's a few. My top ones to always be prepared for are earthquake, terrorist attack, and now fire because that's what I'm, I'm always thinking about. I think for us, as far as natural disasters go, earthquake, fire, and flood. That would be that. Would be that. If you're going to think about anything outside of natural, I would say um, terrorist attack. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Did, did I scare your son? Oh, oh, God, another one? Yes, you're still. <laughs> yes. I got 50,000 questions. I'm sorry. Okay. Now, in our neighborhood, we have seniors, and quite a few of them are disabled, as I am. Okay, now, how do we, uh, for example, will the fire department, could they have a list of everybody who is disabled, can't help themselves, or how does that work? I know you said something about mm -hmm. the neighbors, you know, knowing all this stuff, but there is no, I guess you call a master list of disabled people in the, for example, in the, uh, on down Pacific Avenue in Tacoma. Yeah, so there is, I'm gonna, I, and I don't remember 100% how this works, but there is a way that you can be on a list. It actually has to be, um, Jennifer may know a little bit more about this. You can be, um, there is like a list that you can be put on if you're homebound so that fire and police are aware of that. My suggestion, however, because that list gets if it is still happening, if it's still something that they're utilizing, that list is probably all over the place and long. My suggestion would be that you find someone either within your home or within your neighborhood that would gather that information that you would trust just maybe your name and they don't have to know what's wrong with you. Just maybe your name that you could say, hey, this goes to fire so that they know that we have these people here that are... Um, that have disabilities and aren't able to get out of their home. And that's why these kind of community groups are super important because while you're telling someone, yeah, you now, Roger, you're in charge of making sure fire and or police know that we are in our homes, we don't have the ability to get out. That's all you're gonna have at that time because if you can't pick up the phone and call someone and if you don't have a way to get out of the home, to reach for help, that's, that's what I would, that's gonna be important. So I would suggest maybe finding someone that you trust or, um, and you can call even, I think it's your local fire department. I wanna say it's local fire if you call them, and I should know this, I work with fire, but I wanna say it's your local fire department. If you call them, you can let them know we have this many pe disabled people in our home. So it's already flagged. Let me do some more digging into that and I will touch base with Roxanne sometime tomorrow to get that information back out because I want to be sure that that's still happening and I want to be sure I'm telling you the right way to do that. However, in the meantime, also make sure that community wise, because when poo hits the fan, they're not going to think twice about that list. They're going to go because it's time to save lives. So having someone in your community that you trust with like first name, last name, and maybe house number that it's that list. There's a copy of that list somewhere for if Roger can't do it, maybe the backup person can do it. That's going to be that's going to be your best and most um, most effective bet at that point. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Did I answer your question enough? I'm sorry. I know that I had heard about that a long time ago and I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. But I want to be sure I'm given the right information before I just say, yeah, call your local buyer and put your name on some list because I want to be sure that I'm telling you the right information first. All right. Okay. Now, I got thousands of questions, so I'm going to let somebody else ask more. Okay. I think Roxanne had her hand up. I did. And then I don't know how, I don't know if you can answer this question. So I know on the coast, there's concern about tsunamis. Mm -hmm. um, but inland, we have the waters that come from the coast. So A, I'm not sure what they're called. I think they're called saichis. And what, what is the probability of having that happen inland? Say the water's coming underneath the Narrows Bridge. And I say that because I live on the Key Peninsula and all the way down, and this would happen possibly all the way down to Olympia or the water's coming in from Olympia because where I live, it's 12 miles as the crow flies to Olympia. Um, so it, is that even something that people should think about as well? Or does it really matter because an earthquake is just gonna keep us from going anywhere as you and I have discussed? <laughs> yeah, and it all depends. And I'm just gonna say this because I don't know a whole lot about that. And, but good news is I'm about to start resiliency planning for maritime and the port. So I'll, I'll get to learn more about that as we start that with the coast guard and stuff. So that's coming down the pipeline. What I will say though, it all depends on how high the water is going to rise because if the water, if where you live, because I know if you look at the narrows, right, it's such and such high, but the ground also comes up such, you know, so high from the water there, how high is the water going to rise? We have no idea. Um, we don't know how it'll really affect some of those, like maybe, um, things that are fed by the sound or by the ocean. We don't, we're not really sure until really it happens, but there are, um, there are some studies that have been done that can kind of give you a better idea. So that would be something that either I would try to look at the DNR side or just kind of wait until more comes out about that. Cause as the resiliency planning with the coast guard and all of these other individuals starts happening, they're getting a better operating picture of how these things are starting to flow through all of their cool Like they have like all these cool visuals and you can see how the water would move. The hard part is understanding really where you're at, how that would have an effect. Um, because I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that there's more to come down the pipeline as we get a better understanding of how things are going to be affected um, with a tsunami and any of those um, inland areas that could be affected by rising water. But I think really right now, it just depends on how we don't know until the water start to rise and come in. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer for that. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. I didn't, I, wasn't trying to, um, I can't even think of the word now, it went out of my head. I wasn't trying to trick you. I just oh, no. didn't know if that was something that you had studied or researched yet. And I thought, well, if it isn't, it will be. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Um, I used to know that the tsunami coordinator that used to be at EMD was a really good one. The one, I don't know the one that we have now at state, but these are some questions that they also can answer. So this gives me something to reach back as we plan and move forward to kind of see if she, or I don't know who's in that position now, I think it's still um, um, a lady, see if they can answer my question and then I can have a better operating picture. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. April? Can you talk? about so there's a lot of people you know how they say you know well if there's an emergency I'm coming to your house because they know that you're prepared and they don't want to go to the work of getting prepared so yeah. in an emergency situation like you mentioned you know having some extra water on hand in case a neighbor needs it to you know save their life but at what point, like, how do you determine, you know, how much do you just have it separated? So like you have 
X amount that you can give out and then you have yours set aside so that, because I mean, like people like me, if somebody needed something, I would just, you know, end up giving away all my stuff and then I would end up not having what I needed to survive. So how do you. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, as how would I say this? What I would do if I were you in the, in considering that, cause I don't, I'll be honest, I'm a little selfish with my stuff, but in that, if you are the type of person and you say, this is something that I want to do, I want to have extra to support people. When you go to the grocery store and you say, Hey, these cans of food are on sale. And let's just say it's four, four dollar or four for four dollars. Right. So you buy four cans. Maybe you say, okay, these three cans are for my family and I, and this one can is an extra supply over here, but make sure you have a place that when you store it, it's not fully coming into your home, right? Because you don't know how people are going to act. It's 2021 people, they've got minds of their own and you want to make sure you're protecting yourself and your home. So maybe it's something that you store, um, maybe in your garage or somewhere where you can, because your garage, even if there's no power, you can still manually get it lifted, but you can give, you know, something. But I would just say, if that's, if that's something you wanted to do, when you see a sale or something that allows you to maybe get two for the price of one, or you can get four for a dollar, if something you wanted to do is really store up to help people, then you can do that too. And maybe if you have a neighbor that says, Hey, I want to be involved in this. So maybe every month, you each grab an item and one item is for your family. And then the other item is something you store to support your community. And you're not ever going to have enough to support everybody, right? As much as you wish that you would, you aren't, unless you go buy a bunch of MREs and then everybody's, you know, got high blood pressure because there's (laughs) there's like 1200 grams of sodium or whatever it is. And that it's crazy, but you're never going to have enough, but how can you have something, right? And that's kind of the, the trick there is how can you have something? First and foremost, you can't help anybody unless you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. So put aside for yourself and maybe even as you're rotating out things. So maybe you say, okay, this expires in three months. So I'm going to take this one and put it over here. And then three months, I'll come back and check on it or whatever. And then, you know, you can do that too. So as you're swapping out things, if there's still some time before that expiration, put it aside. Cause you never know within that three months, something could have happened. So it's kind of like, like that. If you find a, the ability to grab two for a price that is reasonable, cause you go out and buy 10 cans of food for yourself and then 10 cans of food, but why do that? So if you can afford to buy something for yourself and it gives, allows you to have a bargain and you can say, these three are for me and this one's over here, these two are here and I'll put these two here. That'd be great. What I would do suggest is maybe partnering with the neighbor because that way you'll store it more faster, but it's not just you in the fight, it's other people. And then hopefully other people would catch on. But if not, at least you're doing something to help uh, the community as much as you can. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I hope that was a good answer to your question. I just, yeah, I'm. Yeah. It's just a hard one because it's like I'm in a couple groups where it's like they're all like, don't post what you, you know what you have stored up because you don't know what will happen when, you know, an emergency happens and you have people around that haven't prepared and you just don't want them coming and stealing all your things. And then, you know, talking about how, how to have something set so that if somebody does come to you that, you know, you're not taking from your own supply, yeah, but still able to help so that they don't, you know, bust in and steal everything because then they think that you are giving yeah I definitely would not um I agree I wouldn't post or really discuss much about what you have unless you're talking about it in a setting of people who are really truly interested because you never know I think about the pandemic and how quick people were just going crazy and it was like toilet paper for some reason everybody's paranoid about losing toilet paper they weren't really caring about the food I can tell you all the bleach that I saw on the shelves and I was like, you don't care about cleaning at least, but toilet paper, everybody's worried about toilet paper for some reason, that's just going to be the one thing they're all without. So, but even in that, it caused 
chaos within the grocery store. So I could only imagine what people would do if they knew you had a supply of something. Cause we see this all the time. People just, they go into survival mode. And then at that point it doesn't matter. Right. I'm going to do what I got to do to take care of whoever. So I would just be mindful of that. If you do have a neighbor and you know, maybe they work double shifts all the time. So, you know, preparedness isn't high on their priority. And that's someone you say, Hey, the food that I put aside is going to be to support that family or down the street. I know this person has a disability and they're stuck in their home. That's going to be the food I put aside to support them. But that way you're still doing something and you're still ready to support. It just might be in a different capacity where it's not widely known. It's known to you and maybe someone else close to you that can help support that effort. But yeah, just be careful because you just never know what people are going to do these days. And, um, you know, if you aren't into, you know, different, I guess, guns, right? So if you aren't into arming yourself, do whatever you can really to make sure you're protecting yourself, but helping your community. And so that's why understanding who in your community can be that close support and help with that. Cause even in that, you're going to need to transport the items, right? You can't just, you're not just going to have them going through some doggy door, which you could, but if you have to get it down the street to someone, you're yeah. going to want to be able to transport it safely. So if everybody knows that you're taking all this food and you're going to go give it to somebody else, it might be, it might be a little hectic. So yeah, I would just be mindful of that. It's okay to talk about preparedness. I wouldn't talk about everything you're how prepared you are right so I'm not going to put on my Facebook hey I'm yeah I'm prepared for three months are you right because then yeah. next thing I know people who live in Horizon Point are going to be hanging out and I'm mm -mm, I gotta you know I got a niece and nephew I gotta hope, <laughs> hope make it here from Puyallup <laughs> so you just just be mindful but and it's a it's definitely a tough line to walk because you want people to know that support is there but you also don't want to be taken advantage of or put yourself in a position where you aren't able to take care of yourself or your family. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I didn't see that you had matches on your list. And I heard that if you, if you wanted to prepare an emergency kit, it's really good to have stick matches in a Ziploc bag stashed somewhere in case you need to light a fire, keep warm or cook or whatever. So just that. Yeah, I think they're, I think they're there. I just don't ever talk because when I start talking about stuff in your kids, I always focus on the things that people don't really think about, but okay. yeah, matches are always good to have. And I have, I remember I did a, an outreach with Roseanne and she was like, I was asking her, I was like, what are these things? And she's like, oh, they're waterproof bags. I don't know if you remember those Jennifer, but they had these waterproof bags with matches in them got me tons of those during my outreach. So they're just hanging out with my waterproof bag with my little matches in it. So yeah, that's kind of, that was funny. I liked it. I was like, oh, all right, great. But that's smart matches for sure. Oh yeah. And waterproof paper. Mm -hmm. That's smart too. I didn't even think about that. That's good. Any other questions for me? Thank you all for giving me your time. Hope some of my jokes were funny about my fish, my poor Belle. She lived a year and a half. So I did hear that betas typically can live two to three years. So I had her for a good year and a half, but then I switched her into a big tank because I wanted her to have this really cool castle because she's a Disney fish. And she was like, this is crazy. You put me in this big old tank and got me these weird snails. Did not go well. She passed away, but she she would not go to the ocean if she were alive and I flushed her. So that was like a Debbie Downer. And I felt like I'm 34 and should know that, but I <laughs> did not did not know you, the fish doesn't go to the ocean. So there's that. But yeah, any other questions for me? No. I guess Connor gets to talk now then, if not, but thank you. I even learned and I've gone to every emergency preparedness thing I could go to um, or had someone go to community meetings. So this has been great and I get to watch it again. Thank you, I appreciate it. So I will put uh, my contact information in the chat. Um, Jennifer, it's so good. I just keep seeing you everywhere. I saw Jennifer at, uh, at our 
WSEMA conference, which is the Washington State Emergency Management uh, Conference. And so, so good to see her. It's been such a long time. I looked a little different because I had had, I was, I had weight loss surgery, but I looked a little different. She was like, that is you. I didn't recognize you. So it's so good to see you. And um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for listening to me. I know I kept you. It's almost eight. I'm sure people want to get back to their normal lives, but Thank you so much for your time. And I'll put my information here in the chat. So if you ever want to reach out, you can get a hold of me. And uh, I'm really excited to have been able to be here today to present to you. And I'm excited for any other presentations I will get to do uh, with this group and the work we'll get to do with Safe Street. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Taika. We appreciate you being here and sharing your experience and the information that you've uh, brought for us. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Before I just run away. Um, I do want to say some people have asked if we would, myself or Julie, who is um, on my staff, if we would come out and talk to community groups, we will come out and talk to your community groups. We do make sure that as long as everybody can social distance. So if you're in a room or something and there's enough room to social distance, then yes, we don't mind. Um, I don't mind, period. So I'll come out. So if you say, hey, we want you know to have you come and talk to our community or we have this group of people that want to talk, feel free to reach out to me and we will make that happen. And I will come in person and do what I can and talk with your groups. So that's it. I did want to put that out there so people didn't think we were all online only. I know it's the best way to get a lot of people together right now, but in these smaller groups that want to have some more personal um, interactions, I don't mind doing that. So that's all I got. Perfect. Thank you.